Well, welcome back, uh, human biology students. Um, hopefully that first uh, recording went okay, only 16 and minutes long and change. This one uh, should be less than 20 minutes also. Uh, I'm going to make an executive decision that um, the exam will um, cover material only through the stomach. So the material on this video lecture will be on quiz two and exam two, not on exam uh, one. Okay, so the small intestine will be the start of material for a quiz, lecture quiz two, exam two. Um, the stomach will end material for exam one. All right, so uh, the notes uh, that uh, you have available to you are on the screen also. Hopefully you can see them uh, sufficiently. Um, we're starting with the small intestine now. So to go back to the <clears throat> image of the digestive tract, we've gone through the oral cavity the um, esophagus, uh, um, into the stomach, through the cardiac sphincter, the pyloric sphincter, and we've entered the small intestine, okay? I mentioned that this image makes it look like um, it connects to the large intestine here. That's not the case. It actually goes behind the large intestine here, and then this is all small intestine as well, okay? It's called small intestine not because of its, its length. It's actually like 20 feet long longer than the large intestine. It's called small intestine because um, it's actually small in diameter, way, way smaller than the large intestine. So that's the reason for the name. There are three parts. Um, the duodenum or duodenum, depending on which side of the pond you're from, uh, the jejunum and the ileum. And uh, really an important um, um, change, if you will, occurs. Um, my wife will talk often about having to put a J tube in somebody, and that's a tube that goes into the jejunum, and uh, it might be for feeding because um, uh, in the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine here, that's predominantly where more digestion goes on. The, the, the remainder of the digestion goes on. Whatever didn't happen in the stomach happens in the, in the first, oh, it's not even that much, 25 centimeters. So if you take a, a, ruler, a ruler out, um, I had a good one here. Here we go. So this little plastic ruler, this is 15 centimeters, so you add about that much to it, you know, just a little more than a foot. Um, that's, that's all of that whole 20 feet uh, of that small intestine that does digesting. But boy, everything that doesn't happen here in the stomach, uh, it's got to happen digesting-wise in that first foot or so of the small intestine. So it's incredibly important. But a J-tube would go just beyond that because then in the J-junum, hence the J, and the ileum, that's where what was digested gets absorbed. And so you might feed somebody with a J-tube. You get it past the duodenum into the J-junum um, so that they could absorb those nutrients that were being fed them. Okay, so, um, so three parts to the small intestine. Duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Duodenum does digesting. Jejunum and ileum mostly absorbing. Um, and so uh, if we look at those parts of the body, they're, they're important. You might know somebody that's lactose intolerance, for instance. And uh, they're lactose intolerance, intolerant because um, um, the body stops producing, in a few people, stops producing the enzyme lactase. Okay, So lactase, as you well know, ends with an ASC and, and would be an enzyme, therefore, and it would work on the molecule lactose. Without lactase, lactose, milk sugar, stays in the small intestine, becomes food for bacteria. You feel bloated, the rotting of that goes on, CO2 uh, gets produced, and more bloating, and it's just an uncomfortable feeling. And so um, that's, that's the chief location where lactose intolerance occurs. Um, inside the small intestine, then, if we go back to another image from your textbook, so, so here if we go back to this one, here's the stomach, we're leaving the stomach, we're going into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. If we look um, at that part of the small intestine, so right here we're looking at it, again that word lumen, that central space, okay, it comes up again. So here's the small intestine, and it's got these folds in it. Now we talked about folds in the stomach, called them rouge. Here we see the small intestine with folds, <coughs> excuse me, as well. And uh, those folds are real important. They're, uh, they're made up of these, these little projections called villi. And if we look at the ends of those um, villi, we're going to be able to find more and more detail. So this artist's rendition, they just taken a piece of this villi right here and, and, and have blown it up. And, and so there's a villus, one villi. 
And here's an electron micrograph picture of that. So, you know, it's pretty close. And um, in the middle of the villi, there are arteries, veins, and lacteal. Now, I'm, I, arteries and veins, you're well aware of. But a lacteal, that's, that's the vessel associated with the lymphatic system. And we're going to get into that in more detail. But I wanted to point out where it was. Now, um, there's, there's a lot of important stuff happening in the small intestine, of course. And it's got to have a close-by blood supply. And so you can now here see that close-by blood supply in these villas. So, so now what's happened here is if we go to this electron micrograph picture of a villus, and we take just a tiny portion, and so I, let me go back to here for a second. Here you can see the columnar epithelium that make up the surface of the villus, those long slender cells. The dark purple would be the nuclei. So um, that's what we're seeing here with just a little bit less detail. But if we look at that one portion of, of the top of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, a part of a villus, that's what's right here blown up. We can see that even the top of that villi is, is itself subdivided into all these microvilli, even tinier finger-like projections. So if this was one columnar epithelial cell, which that's a good way to think about that, might well be pictured there, then, then the top of that one columnar uh, uh, epithelial cell is itself lined with all these microvilli. And the purpose here is to increase the surface area in the inside of the small intestine. If you increase the surface area, you've got all that much more area to do uh, the work of the small intestine, to digest, and then even more importantly, to break down what has been digested, and to, uh, I mean to break down, to absorb what has been digested. That's the main function of all these little projections here. The villi and the microvilli is to increase the surface area of the small intestine, mostly in the jejunum and the ileum, so that it can absorb what has been digested. In fact, you take that whole 20 foot long tube, and if you stretch out all the villi, and you stretch out all the micro microvilli and lay them flat, you would have an area equivalent to a doubles tennis court. <laughs> That's from one 20 foot tube inside your body. You stretch it out, lay it flat. That's what kind of surface area you got. And all the better to digest you with, my dear. Okay, to steal a line from the big bad wolf, right? Okay, so, um, yeah, that's what's going on there. That's why the structure of the small intestine is like it is. Now, it's easy to understand, I hope, that, you know, here you are in the stomach. Well, you are here. There's uh, an environment in the stomach, and it's very acidic. And right away you go into the small intestine. It's not going to magically change instantaneously when it gets into the small intestine. So the small intestine has to deal with that acidic environment. Now pretty quickly it's going to try to neutralize or buffer that excess acid. But it's also got to be lined with goblet cells along here which produce mucus to protect it as well from that acidic environment. Now just like the stomach and gastrin, there are hormonal, hormonal controls of the small intestine. So the first thing you got to do, your body has to do, is it has to turn off uh, the stomach because you want to conserve resources. You don't want a stomach that's continually producing <clears throat> high volumes of hydrochloric acid and pepsin, pepsinogen. That would be inefficient and would be damaging to the stomach. So you got to turn the stomach off. Now, this is... Um, edition two of your textbook from 30 some years ago. It's the first one I used for this this class. I've stuck with them or with her, Sylvia Mater. And uh, in this textbook, there's a, a segment right here. You can't read it, but I'll read it for you. That talks about a hormone that turns the stomach off. It says, still another hormone has only recently been discovered. GIP, gastric inhibitory peptide produced by the small intestine, apparently works in opposition to gastrin because it inhibits gastric secretions. <coughs> well, what they did was, they did some research on people at times, found the time when the stomach was emptying, needed to be turned off, and they found high levels of GIP in the stomach. They just assumed that GIP was the hormone that turned the stomach off, and so they named it gastric inhibitory peptide. Well, further research showed that 
it didn't do that at all. <laughs> it's uh, not involved with turning the stomach off. Um, GIP actually um, triggers insulin release, causes the pancreas to dump insulin into the bloodstream. And if you remember, insulin goes to the cells and causes more um, 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 protein carrier molecules to go into the membrane to allow glucose to get into the cell. Without insulin, the glucose stays in the blood, doesn't get into the cell. The person can't produce um, ATP the same way, and you have all the characteristics of diabetes. Isn't that crazy? So now they've discovered that another hormone actually does turn the stomach off. It's called cholecystokinin. That's kind of fun to say, cholecystokinin. I'm not going to expect you to have to say it. We're just going to abbreviate that, CCK, okay? Cholecystokinin, you can just call it CCK. Not content to leave GIP dangling out there with a, with a problematic name, they've decided to re, to, to re define the G, the I, and the P. They now call GIP, they say it now means glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. Oh, that's a big help. <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're not going there. GIP, okay. So, we're looking at the hormonal control of the small intestine. Uh, GIP is there, yep, yep, it is, but it doesn't shut the stomach off. CCK does, cholecystokinin does. And then it also causes bile release. Now, um, oops. in this picture, here's the stomach. We looked at this before. Here's the liver, and embedded under the lobe of the liver is the gallbladder. Now, the gallbladder stores bile. In the last lab, you probably read about bile. We didn't do much with it. It's going to come up in the next lab on digestion. But its job is to help us digest fat. And the way it does that is by, uh, by helping fat break into smaller parts um, in the digestive tract. Basically, helps by adding a, a water-loving part, almost like a phospholipid does, you know. It, it adds a water-loving part so that fat can go through the, the digestive tract and we can actually absorb, uh, absorb some of what we digest, uh, which is a good thing. So bile is important. It's produced in the liver. It's stored in the gallbladder and concentrated in the gallbladder. It gets pumped into the small intestine right here, and, uh, and, and cholecystokinin helps stimulate that whole process. Okay, now I'm going to talk about four uh, hormones here, and the first two have two functions I'm going to mention. The last two have just one function each that I'm going to mention. But you got to understand, in reality, there are multiple functions. I'm just hitting the main ones and uh, multiple functions that each of them do. So, uh, again, back, we're going to talk about control of the small intestine. So the first thing we've done is we've shut off the stomach with cholecystokinin. We've gotten the gallbladder to start to pump bile into the small intestine to help with fat digestion. Okay. Then along comes another hormone, this one right down here, secretin. It's not a secret. Um, the secretin is, is produced, most of these are produced by the wall of the small intestine, by the way, um, as various sensors stimulate them. Remember with gastrin, it was uh, the presence of proteins and stretch receptors. Uh, well, with secretin, uh, the acid that comes into the small intestine trigger, triggers the small intestine to produce secretin, which goes to the pancreas and tells the pancreas to dump bicarbonate into the small intestine. Now, hopefully bicarbonate rings a bell, because we've talked about it quite a bit. It was that main acid buffering molecule, and this should make sense. The stomach, with all its acid, dumps that acid into the small intestine. small intestine doesn't want it, and so it's got to neutralize that acid. It does it by stimulating the pancreas to dump bicarbonate into the small intestine and neutralize that acid. Bring the pH of this environment more towards neutral. The other thing that secretin does is it causes the pancreas to dump a bunch of digestive enzymes in here. If we look at some of those from another image from your book, um, you'll see amylase, maltase, peptidase. Um, these are all lipase. Uh, these are all enzymes that um, get dumped into uh, the small intestine, mostly from the pancreas. 
and secretin causes that to happen. Okay, so there's two of the four. We've already talked about the third one in your notes. So if we look at your notes, you see here GIP is the third one listed. I've already mentioned it because it was misnamed. It does have a, a role. It does have a function. It's triggered by fat and glucose entering the small intestine. And GIP is what triggers insulin to get dumped into the blood supply and, um, and help with um, uh, sugar digestion, if you will, with sugar absorption into the cells. So GIP does have a, have a function. It's got other functions too, but triggers insulin release is, is the one I'm highlighting. Then lastly is motilin. Something is, is, is termed motile if it's able to move well. And so here, motilin helps um, the small intestine move well. Uh, and, and so peristalsis that we looked at in the esophagus is going all the way through the whole small intestine. That's what's moving through food through the whole small intestine is peristalsis. And motilin sort of speeds that up. Interestingly enough, at, at uh, high pHs, it speeds up peristalsis. At low pHs, acidic pHs, it actually slows peristalsis. But, you know, here the pH has been raised because sodium bicarbonate has gotten in there. So it's trying to move through food through the system, get it digested, get that waste material out of the body. That's motilin's job. Uh, let me just check and see where I'm at. Yeah, okay, good. This is, I would have asked if there are any questions multiple times by now, but um, you have the option of stopping the video, rewinding it, and then please write those questions down. If I don't answer them in the video, ask them in class, and I would love to answer them there if I can. Okay, last little bit for this video is, um, we'll go back here. So we've, we've gone through this part of your notes. I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of these associated organs. The liver... Um, the gallbladder I've already talked about, the pancreas I've talked about, and so let's just zoom in on them just a little bit more. I talked about the fact that the liver um, produces bile, right here, the liver produces bile, and bile is made up of bilirubin. Now, that's, gonna, that's a term that's going to come up again when we get to the blood supply because bilirubin actually um, is a, a, a breakdown product. When blood cells get old and worn out, your body recycles them. And in that recycling process, it produces bilirubin. Well, it doesn't just, you know, discard bilirubin necessarily. Um, it sends it to the liver, or the liver helps with that process. It takes that bilirubin and, 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 and combines it with cholesterol to form bile. That's what, that's what bile is, cholesterol and bilirubin. Uh, and the gallbladder stores and concentrates it. Now, I'm guessing you know a lot of people that have had troubles with gallbladder. And uh, maybe it was gallstones. I've got some gallstones here. I, I wish I were in class, but um, let's see. There's a gallstone. I'll just hold it like that. There's a gallstone. That's a, a smallish gallstone. And what it would do, it, was, it would sit uh, right in here somewhere and plug the normal flow of, of bile. Um, here's, here's, a, here's a whopper of a gallstone. Yeah, I'll wash my hands before I eat, eat lunch. Okay. I hope you can see that. I mean, that, that would be horrible. And it, it is. It physically feels like a rock. And, and it really is ultra-concentrated bile. Um, and if a person has that, the bile will back up. It'll build up in here. But remember, oftentimes um, you don't have an organ pain directly associated here. In the case of gall, gallbladder problems, it often, dissociate, or it often defers to the upper shoulder region. And I had a student one year. Um, we talked about this, and the very next week, um, bingo, she, she experienced that. And sure enough, it was, it was a gallbladder in, inflammation or infection. So if that gets plugged, it can become infected. It will become inflamed. Um, you can sometimes deal with that with medications. Sometimes it has to surgically be removed. I had a student uh, talk, you know, uh, that had uh, her gallbladder removed. And, of course, um, people vary in how they respond to that. Your liver is going to continue to produce bile. It won't be concentrated, but it will continue to, to put it into your small intestine sort of gradually. Um, you won't be able to get a big dose of it at once. And uh, we talked about that at some length uh, afterwards, a student and I, and she says, well, that's why I get such a stomachache when I eat a big pizza meal. 
they, they hadn't really coached her well on how she needed to adjust her diet. Um, and so she would eat a big bunch of pizza with all the fat in it. Well, her body's looking for a lot of bile, a big load of bile to help digest that. Well, it's not available. She doesn't have a gallbladder anymore. It just keeps leaking in a little bit of bile, a little bit of bile, and it doesn't digest it effectively. And, uh, and she would get a bellyache from that. Now, not everybody that's lost their gallbladder experiences that same sensation, but you know, a little post-operative uh, instruction would have been in order uh, for her, would have helped her um, live, live better. So we got that straightened out, I think. So um, yeah, that's the gallbladder and gallstones. Okay, last bit in, then on, on the uh, small intestine, let's look at what happens when uh, those uh, materials that you've eaten are broken down. So in the case of carbohydrates uh, and amylase, now this is pancreatic amylase. Um, we're going to deal with salivary amylase uh, in lab next week. It's the same molecule, just different source. Salivary is in your spit, pancreatics from your pancreas. What does it do? It breaks, uh, malto, it breaks a, 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 a long chain like a starch into maltose, which is a, a disaccharide. Maltase comes along and breaks it into glucose. And that then enters the, the, the cells uh, of your lining your small intestine and enters the bloodstream by active transport. Same with protein. Broken down into amino acids, active transport into the bloodstream. I can't emphasize enough how important this is. If it was simply diffusion, only half of the carbs and only half of the proteins that you ate would actually get into your bloodstream because diffusion would stop moving molecules when you had about the same amount um, in the small intestine as was in the bloodstream. There would be no reason for them to move if there was um, only diffusion causing them to move. So again, you are incredibly made because God said, no, we're going we're gonna to spend energy here and uh, use ATP to move um, amino acids and glucoses against a concentration gradient. That means from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration so that uh, half of what you eat doesn't get wasted. You, you make the most of what you eat by taking that glucose and that amino acids, spending ATP to move them to an area of high concentration and make it an even higher concentration. That, that's pretty cool. I, I don't know, in my mind, that's pretty cool. Um, so then um, what happens? So the liver will take excess glucose and, and convert it. So that the, these, these glucoses, if you don't use them, don't convert, use them to make ATP. They'll get stored in your liver as glycogen. We talked about that as kind of like the starch of the human body, a long chain of carbohydrate. Um, amino acids go to the liver for short-term storage. So these right here go to the liver for short-term, for short while. If they're not used, they get converted to glucose. Yeah, you can actually convert an amino acid uh, to another type of organic molecule, and your liver can do that. And um, uh, converted to glucose, uh, which would then go to glycogen and stored. Uh, and then it would also, that process would also produce urea, which you would excrete in urine. <coughs> fats are a little more complicated. Um, fats uh, are mixed with bile uh, that emulsifies, that breaks them up into smaller droplets. And a lipase then is going to come along and break them into glycerol and fatty acids. And it's going to, it's going to coat them with uh, proteins and make them into a chylomicron. And, and these are going to um, enter the lacteal. They're not going to go into the blood supply. They're going to go into the lacteal. And um, um, this is a, a slower process. Uh, they're going to diffuse into the lacteal. So no energy spent here, but um, that means uh, if there's a lot of fat, a lot of fatty acids here and few here, then they'll diffuse in until they're equally distributed. But then that fat's got to go down the digestive tract a little farther before there's uh, a lot of fats here and few here and more will diffuse in. And so it takes longer for fats to get into that um, lymphatic system. They're not eat that the lymphatic system now is connected to the blood supply. But um, notice this is a, a less direct um, way of getting the digested products of fat. Uh, into your circulatory system. It takes longer to digest fat. And some of this is why. The diffusion, the entrance into the lymphatic system, which then goes to the blood supply, all means it takes longer to digest fat. All right, so 
So this is where, so <clears throat> arteries are going to carry blood away from the heart. Uh, veins are going to carry blood back to the heart. And so what you have digested, the proteins and the, and the carbs, are going to end the, en enter the blood supply. The fats that you eat are going to enter that lacteal. And um, that's going to go back towards the heart, enter the venous blood supply back by the heart, and, and eventually get there. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. That will be material that will be on, on quiz two and exam two. This material on the small intestine will not be on the next exam. You have a good day, and I'll see you on Monday.